In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The gospel story we just heard has been a source of consternation for scholars and interpreters from the very beginning. The reason for this is not the outcome of the story, that Jesus ultimately healed the woman's daughter, but rather the internal details, as well as the setting. It's short, so let me read it again. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. So several things have jumped out as a bit odd. First, Jesus seemingly ignored the woman. He didn't answer her at all, Matthew wrote. Second, after his disciples insisted he send her away, he told them, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Third, to use a phrase that had some currency a few years ago, Yet she persisted, despite social conventions that would have forbade it. Fourth, in response, Jesus basically insulted her, implying that as a little doggy, a Canaanite woman had no right to expect any benefits set for the Jewish people. Fifth, yet she persisted and responded in such a way that sixth, she changed Jesus' mind, was commended for her faith, and had her wish granted. Now, what are we to make of this? A surface reading would suggest that Jesus was A, rude, B, a racist, or at least reflective of the Jewish disdain of Canaanites, but also C, capable of changing his mind. If any of these were the case, then some of the traditional understandings we have of Jesus are thrown into question. How could Jesus be rude? Racist? Everything else we've learned from the Gospels seems to show that he championed inclusivity. And if the Son of God can change his mind about this matter, is anything secure? So you might be able to understand the interpretive problems. Some have suggested that Jesus was testing the woman. That is, did she really want the healing for her daughter? And how far was she willing to go to get it? Or was Jesus trying to draw out the woman's insight to make a point? Others have noted that Jesus addressed his seeming refusal to engage the woman telling the disciples that he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, perhaps forcing them to recall he had sent them on, that, on a mission to that same group. And thus he was challenging them to understand the full nature of the interaction he was having with this woman. The lost sheep were the first audience, but now things have changed. Still others have let the story mean exactly what it appears to say while reading it that way, raises questions about Jesus. It really emphasizes the power of the Canaanite woman's argument. She forced Jesus, so single-mindedly headed in one direction, to do a 180. It really may, in the end, make little difference. In the words of one commentator, 
<clears throat> quote, this is inevitably speculation. What is certain is that the story does not end where it begins, that is, in a racial standoff between the Jewish teacher and the Canaanite woman. And when eventually her appeal is granted, there is no sign of reluctance on Jesus's part, but rather an exceptionally warm commendation of her faith. In other words, this story, regardless of all that internal stuff, tells of the expansion of the Jesus movement, to use our presiding bishop's favorite description of Christianity, from a small ethnic-centered sect to an all-inclusive faith. This is totally in character with the rest of Matthew. You may recall a very similar story a few chapters earlier where it was a Roman centurion who came to Jesus for the healing of his son or servant. He too had to argue his point. His request too was granted and he too was commended for his faith. But there's another oddity for which I found no good explanation. It's the setting of the story. Our reading began, Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. That place he left was Gennesaret on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. You may remember from last week that that's where the boat with Jesus and the disciples landed after the walking on water story. What's puzzling to me is why Jesus would leave Galilee and walk about 50 miles to the coast, to the homeland of Israel's traditional enemy. And just to give this some visual reference, you may be able to see the red lines on the map. They're the roads. So it wasn't even an easy 50 miles from point A to point B. It may be, as one scholar suggested, that Jesus knew he and his disciples would get away from the Jewish crowds if he went to Tyre and Sidon. But I wonder if there might be another reason for the relocation, one that might shed some light on the story's other troubling questions. I wonder if Jesus suspected that the disciples, that is the infant church, would be more easily swayed to give up their insular ways if they were outside their own world. In other words, the story of the Capernaum centurion was indeed the story of faith of a Gentile, but of a Gentile as Luke tells it, who was already sympathetic to the Jews having built Capernaum's synagogue. The situation in Tyre and Sidon was entirely different. These were the Jews' traditional enemies. Jesus and the disciples were the outsiders in the Canaanite woman's land. Yet to these outsiders and their charismatic leader, this poor mother came to plead her case. In this, my interpretation, Jesus found an opportunity to teach his disciples a thing or two about inclusion. This for me helps explain Jesus' apparent rudeness in ignoring the woman. Isn't that what the disciples would expect you to do with an enemy? That's what they were doing. This for me helps explain Jesus' reminding the disciples of his initial audience, the lost sheep. This, for me, helps explain Jesus' response to the woman, which the disciples probably silently cheered. But then, when the woman showed a much better understanding of the Hebrew ideas of justice than the disciples, Jesus altered course and commended her for it. He then healed her daughter. She was included in the blessings promised the Jews. The moral of the object lesson? The Jews, the infant church, had no lock on the Jesus movement. But it took dislocation, being out of familiar territory, to drive that point home.
Certainly on the surface, the story contains a message about the radical inclusivity of the Jesus movement. Jesus dealt with a woman from an enemy culture. That woman, outsider, won an argument with Jesus. And Jesus gave her what she needed. No barriers were to be retained between God's love and the recipients of that love. There is the message that even our enemies may have some understanding that eludes us. We can be taught by those with whom we disagree. But I think, too, that being forced into an alien surrounding, leaving Galilee for Tyre and Sidon, can open possibilities that we might otherwise discount. What strikes me, of course, is the fact that we've been taken out of our familiar surroundings by COVID. The crisis brought on by the virus has affected us in so many ways, and we're dealing with them the best we can, trying to maintain some sort of normalcy that would look a lot like how things were before. What happened with the disciples and Jesus, lead, heading off to an unknown place, is that the crisis brought about by the feisty Canaanite woman meant that they could not return to a Galilee that they had left. Yes, the physical structures of their homeland would remain. That synagogue built by the centurion would still be there. But the disciples, the infant church's understanding of who was granted entry was radically changed. In the same vein, the ways in which we return to our synagogue have been challenged and radically altered by our time in COVID land and by what we've learned through our experiments with technology. Some of the things we will find upon our return are things that we've been addressing for a long time, such as the number or nature or time of our Sunday services, or how do we do outreach, or what does Christian education for children, youth, and adults look like? But we've seen another faithful response that we might not have seen had we not had to venture out of our homeland. Participation in evening meetings or classes is a bit easier. Folks can attend our services from either coast or overseas, or when prevented by injury, illness, or weather. Engagement with one another is not tied to a place. Indeed, one of the things we've learned is that Good Shepherd is a church that, when it can, gathers in a building at Yosemite and Dry Creek. But we are not that building. After their encounter with the woman, Jesus and his disciples almost immediately left Tyre and Sidon. They returned, in a slightly roundabout way, to Galilee. I wonder what they talked about in their long journey. How did they debrief that episode? We'll never know. What the gospel does suggest, however, is that on their way home, they continued to heal those who needed it, and that they fed a vast crowd of 4,000 plus, which many commentators believe was primarily Gentile. Their time in the region of Tyre and Sidon changed them and broadened their perspectives. So the question before us, of course, is what might, we, what might we take away from our time with the enemy in COVID land? How might we be changed to minister to our neighbors? These are the conversations we need to be having. And there are opportunities aplenty, beginning with our faith forum time following this service, where the discussions will center around what the future Good Shepherd might look like. Amen.